It's wonderful to see everyone this morning. It's good to have our visitors with us. It's good to see David with us again. And uh, I sir, certainly appreciate Brother Kevin for getting up here and leading singing. I uh, looked around this morning trying to figure out who was going to lead singing. I didn't see our normal song leaders. I am really proud of these young men who will step up, get out of their comfort zone, and help lead in worship. When one reads the four gospel accounts, you might be surprised how often Jesus Christ talks about judgment. In fact, a lot of the parables that Jesus spoke has to deal with the great judgment in the last day. Parables like the wheat and the tares, the parable of the talents, the parable of the dragnet, just to name a few. And a lot of these parables and a lot of his illustrations, he talks about the twofold division of humanity, those going to heaven, those going to hell. He also uses illustrations like the wheat and the chaff, the sheep and the goats, the narrow road and the broad way, the wise and the foolish builders, the wise and the foolish virgins, and also the prepared and the unprepared guests, just to name a few. And though the theme of, of judgment runs all throughout Jesus' teachings, the longest discourse he had concerning his second coming and the judgment are found in Matthew chapters 24 and 25. If you have your Bibles, you might want to turn to Matthew 24. This is where we're going to focus our lesson on. And the setting here in these chapters is the last week of Jesus' life before his crucifixion. The triumphal entry into Jerusalem happened on Sunday. We see this in Matthew chapter 21. And the final debate between the Pharisees and the Sadducees is found in Matthew 22. And all of this has already taken place. And Jesus and his disciples are now leaving the temple area. And his disciples are talking about the temple. And if you read anything about the temple, you will notice it is a very magnificent structure. It was built by Herod. This is not the original temple built by Solomon, but it was destroyed by the Babylonians, and now this one is built by Herod, but it's still very magnificent. It was built on top of a mountain. It was about 165 feet tall, and it was made of white marble, and it was decorated with gold around the top. Josephus, a historian, said it looked like a snowy mountain glittering in the sun. It was beautiful. The temple looked like a building that would stand forever. So you can only imagine the confusion and the bewilderment when Jesus told his disciples that the time would come when there would not be left here one stone upon another that would not be thrown down, Matthew chapter 24, verse 2. Now, <coughs> excuse me, in the next verse, in verse 3, they're going to ask Jesus some questions. It said, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? The destruction of this temple was so unbelievable, they could only think it, it could happen at the end of the world. Not only were these disciples confused here, but so have many throughout the ages been very confused about Jesus' teaching. The key to this passage is understanding that Jesus is talking about two judgments here in Matthew chapters 24 and 25. You have God's judgment upon Jerusalem when it was destroyed here in chapter 24, verses 4 through 35. And then you have the second coming and the final judgment in verse 36 through the end of chapter 25. Now, in response to the disciples' questions, Jesus gave a number of signs to warn them about the approaching destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. He first gave seven general signs. There would be false messiahs, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, the persecution and death of believers, false prophets would come, and the proclamation of the gospel throughout the whole world. All of this happened before Jerusalem fell in AD 70. But they're called general signs because many of them have occurred again and again throughout the history of the church. Now, after the seven general signs, Jesus then gives a very specific sign, the eighth one, and that is the abomination of desolation. 
That language actually comes from the book of Daniel. And it might be difficult for us to understand what it's even talking about if it were not for the parallel verse in Luke chapter 21, 20. When it says, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that her desolation is at hand. Jesus warned his disciples that when they saw the armies, the Roman armies circle around Jerusalem, it's time for them to get out of the city and don't even come back to the house to get supplies or belongings. Those who heeded this warning were able to escape the Roman destruction. History tells us not a single Christian ever lost their life in that because they heeded the warnings. By contrast, though, the unbelieving Jews, they crowded into this city, thinking that they were going to have safety in this great walled city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem and the temple were completely destroyed by the Roman army. According to Josephus, 1,100,000 Jews lost their lives, and 97,000 were captured and enslaved. The description of God's judgment upon Jerusalem ends in Matthew chapter 24, verse 34, where it says, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. When Jerusalem fell, it was not just another event in history. This is God's judgment upon a nation that has turned wicked. America needs to sit up and take notice. But in verse 36, Jesus turns to another day. He says, but of that day an hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. This verse marks the transition of Jesus' teaching on the judgment that was going to come upon Jerusalem to the second coming and the judgment of the world. He's shifting gears now. The word that Jesus used to describe his word is the word coming, and it is taken from the Greek word parousia. And this word was used by the ancients to describe the arrival of a king or emperor to visit his subjects. It's used four times here in Matthew chapter 24, all of them referring to our king that was going to come. We see it in verse 3, verse 27, verse 37, and verse 39. This is the only time that this word actually appears in the four Gospels, even though it does appear other times in the epistles. But the disciples ask, what would be the sign of his coming when all this is going to happen? In Mark 13, 32, Jesus told them he didn't even know the day or the hour that he was coming. So if Jesus didn't know, nobody else knows the time of his coming, how are they going to ever give signs for that coming? Jesus gave them signs concerning his coming and the destruction of Jerusalem, but there would be no signs for the end of the world. Only the Father alone knows when that's going to happen. Now, what Jesus taught about his final judgment more than anything else was the sudden unexpectedness of it. There would be no signs signaling his coming. But Jesus gave six illustrations here in Matthew chapters 24 and 25 of what his coming would be like. And in every case, it would be sudden and it would be unexpected. Now, for those who were unprepared, it was going to be a very terrifying moment. Now, in verses 37 through 42 of chapter 24, the coming of the Lord would be like the flood in the days of Noah. Two men would be in the field. One would be taken and one, one left. Two women would be grinding at the mill. One would be taken. The other one would be left. In verses 43 through 45, it would be like a thief who breaks into a home at night. And he does so without warning. And they don't know the time of his coming. In verses 45 through 51, it would be like the master who comes to his servants and he finds one working very faithfully, but he finds the other one doing evil. In Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, it would be like the ten virgins and the coming of the bridegroom. Some are going to be prepared, some are going to be unprepared. In verses 14 through 30, the master would be like the master who gave his three servants talents he went away, and then he comes back to reckon with them. 
In verses 31 through 46, it would be the coming of the Son of Man in all his glory. And he's going to sit on the great judgment seat like a shepherd and divide the sheep from the goats. Now, the three illustrations in Matthew 25, they're pretty familiar to most of us who, are, who know our Bibles. But I want to emphasize a lesson on the judgment from each one of them. And the first one teaches watchfulness. The parable of the virgins, of course, that is far removed from our lifestyles today. Uh, this parable reflects the life and the customs of the New Testament times. And, of course, the marriage customs were quite different back then than what they are today. But back then, when a young man and a woman were going to be married, they went home, they kept open house for their chosen friends, and the festivities would go on for about a week. The bride and her friends, they would wait at her home for the bridegroom to come to get her. But they didn't know when he was going to come, and such was the case in Jesus' parable. It's midnight, and they hear the cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet, them, meet him. But as these bridesmaids get ready to walk through the village trees to begin that week-long celebration, five of those virgins realize that they don't have enough oil for the lamps, and their lamps are starting to go out. And when they find out that the other five bridesmaids do not have enough oil to share with them, they have to go out into the city to try to find some oil to buy. But remember, it's midnight. In the meantime, while they're out searching for oil, the bridegroom comes, and the celebration begins, and the door is shut. And once it's shut, it's not going to be opened. The lesson is always to be watching, always to be ready, for you don't know the day nor the hour when he comes. Christ's coming is going to be sudden. It's going to be unannounced. But it is to be expected. We know he's coming. He said he is. So the only way we can be ready is to always be watchful at all times. Nearly 2,000 years have slipped by. And yet he still hasn't come. Judgment hasn't begun. And sadly, many people have quit watching. We're so busy enjoying the good life that we really don't think too much about the judgment seat of Christ and that we're all going to have to stand there one day. But it's just like those five foolish virgins. We're going to be left out if our focus on that day becomes blurred. We have to be vigilant because there's some things that we're not going to find at the last minute. I don't know how many of you have ever read or heard of the book, The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. It's a premillennial book and talking about the rapture and how people find out that Jesus is coming and the rapture's beginning and they just frantically go out trying to get goods and stuff to, to survive this ordeal. Well, that's a bunch. I think Tommy Moore has a Greek word for that. That's hogwash. Nothing to that at all. A Christian cannot find a lifetime of holiness in five minutes when Jesus comes. We have to find it now. To be a child of God and walk in fellowship with him is the most important personal thing that we could ever do in this world. And if we don't know Jesus now and follow him now, it's going to be too late when he comes. If you've not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you don't have time to repent or get to the water. When Jesus comes, and judgment begins it's going to be in the twinkling of an eye. As fast as you can blink your eye, it's going to happen. You have time now. Today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. The second parable is that of the talents. The lesson's about stewardship here. A man going into a far country calls all of his servants together. He entrusts property to them. To one he gives five talents, to another he gives two, and another one he gives one. When the man went away, these three men are stewards of this property, this property that has been, been entrusted to them, and they are to use it in service of that man. Two of the servants were very faithful, and they gained other money. They actually doubled their money, and when the Lord returned, they were blessed with the same. 
But the one talent man knew that his master was a hard man and a difficult man. He was unfair. So he was going to play it safe. And he went out and buried his talent. When the Lord returned, he said, I've got your talent. Still have it. Safe and sound. But that's all he got. He was cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Just as those servants were entrusted with various sums of money and they were to use that money in service of the Lord, we also are endowed with different natural abilities. And these abilities come from God. And we're to use those in service to our God. Some Christians have talent of knocking doors, some holding home Bible studies. Some even have a talent of going out into the mission field and doing work in foreign countries or other places of this country that's now mission fields. But if they try to encourage these things on others by trying to lay a burden upon them, saying that the, you know this is something you've got to do, they guilt trip them into doing things like this, they're being a whole, whole lot more harsh than God is. God has given us different talents, and he demands that we use what we have. That's not saying that we can't gain more talents, but we are to use what we have. God will judge us upon the faithfulness of the opportunities and the talents that we have, not by those things that we don't have. God does not expect A's out of a B student. But he also doesn't expect B's and C's out of someone who's capable of making an A. The one talent man was condemned not because he failed to produce. He was condemned because he failed to try. The judgment of Christ is going to be based upon our stewardship. And I hope that you are using your God-given talents to his service instead of just sitting on them and hiding them like that one talent man. Remember, it's far better to try and to fail than to fear to try. There's nothing more damning to a person than to sit back and do nothing the last illustration teaches service to others. Jesus finally gives a picture of the judgment scene and Jesus coming in all of his glory in verse 31 through 46. All nations are going to be gathered before him and he's going to be like a shepherd who's going to divide the sheep from the goats. The sheep will be able to go into eternal life, but the goats into everlasting destruction. And he's going to say to those on his right hand in verses 35 through 36, I was a hungered and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous are going to say, Lord, when have we ever done this? Look at, listen to his response in verse 40. Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Lost on the other hand, they failed to render these simple services, and they were cast out. They were considered as goats. You might notice that Jesus never mentions a lot of the important issues that we preach on a lot today. He didn't say anything about baptism or the church or Lord's Supper or instrumental music or qualifications of elders or marriage, divorce, or remarriage. It's not to say that these things are important. Because otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have said something about them in other places. All he's got to talk about is just one time. New Testament makes sound doctrine important in the life of the church. But we notice that Jesus didn't even say anything about that here either. Because that's not the point of our Lord in this parable. He's making a specific point here. But when our Lord made service as the basis of our, the final separation... It should warn us that the gospel that stresses correct belief to the neglect of a life of service is not the message of Christ. We do have to believe sound doctrine. We do have to practice sound doctrine, but we also have to practice service to others. Remember these qualities here. Watchfulness, stewardship, 
service to others. We need to build our lives around these things. When we do, we can face the judgment seat of Jesus Christ if we are Christians and have obeyed the gospel and do so with confidence and joy. Of course, you have to be a child of God before you can ever face the judgment in a right way, in a good way. If you've never obeyed the gospel, we're going to give you that opportunity this morning. If you know what you need to do and you just still haven't done it, my question to you is why? Why would you take a chance with your soul? Soul is the most important thing that you ever have. The only thing that you're going to take into eternity with you. Everything else you're going to be leaving behind. But that soul is going to last with you. It's the eternal part of man. And just putting it off because, well, I don't want to seem like a hypocrite. Well, don't be a hypocrite. Change your life. That's what repentance is all about. You repent before you're baptized, and you're baptized to change your relationship with God. You then become a child of God. And if we can help you with that, the water's ready. If you're a child of God, and yet you're not living as you should, you need to make some changes too. Because our entrance into heaven is going to depend upon our faithfulness to him. If there's anything that we can help you with, you have the opportunity to respond while together we stand and sing.